If you would please open your Bibles with me. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 1. Matthew 18, verse 1. And it says this. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. A great child. Have you ever wanted to be great? Yes. I hear some honest voices. I also have wanted to be great. When I was a child, I dreamed of becoming great. I thought I would love to be president. I would love to be a pilot. Oh, maybe I'd like to be a professor like my dad. I want to make a name for myself. I want to be somebody. And as I finished university, I decided I wanted to become a great journalist. But how? I went to school at a university where my dad taught in Illinois. And as I was graduating, I looked around and I thought, I have no experience. I don't know anybody with connections. I don't know how to become a great journalist. If I work here in Illinois with no experience, I have to start working as a very small, not great, small journalist at a very small suburban newspaper. My salary will be extremely small. I'll end up writing stories about how they had to find stolen bicycles and rescue cats caught in trees, and no one's ever going to notice me, and I'll never become a great writer working for a big newspaper like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. I need something else. What can I do? And as I thought about this, I noticed that far away in Russia, this was in 1996, far away in Russia, there were big stories happening and being covered by ex reporters from America with very little experience, about the same age as me. There was Boris Yeltsin, the president, in the hospital. There was a war going in Chechnya. And I saw that there was a very small newspaper called the Moscow Times in Moscow, Russia, that was writing about these really big stories. And they were writing in English, and their reporters, like I said, were young with very little experience. I thought, if I could get over there, I think I could become a great journalist much faster. Because those journalists over there in Russia writing for that newspaper would write the, newspaper, write the story for that newspaper, and then they would resell their stories to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and get their name there also. I thought, this is my dream job. I have to get over there. But how? So I wrote an email to the editor-in-chief of the newspaper and said, please hire me. <laughs> he was really nice. He asked my resume, and he wrote back to me and said, how is your Russian? Well, I didn't know a word of Russian, except for maybe not. And he didn't write back to me when I confessed that I knew no Russian. But I was not discouraged. I was determined I was going to become great. So I decided I'll go to Russia anyway, and maybe somehow get a job at that newspaper. So during my last semester at the university, I worked really hard, and I bought a one-year business visa to Russia. You could do that back then, really easily. And I bought a one-way plane ticket to Moscow. I had no plans to come back. I was going to stay there. All my eggs were in that basket. I was going to be in Russia and learn and become a great journalist. My mom was quite worried. She said to me, Andy, what's going to happen if you don't get a job? I said, Mom, don't worry. I will get a job. And if I run out of money, you know, I'll sleep with the metro if I have to. No problem. I'll find some way to succeed there. So on the day after my graduation from university, I jumped on the plane and I flew to Moscow. In my pocket, I had $700 to pay for rent in an apartment and a lot of hopes. That was it. I also want to tell you that I flew to Russia without God. As Marcia said, I was raised in a missionary family. My parents, I was born actually in Zambia. I grew up in Zimbabwe. I lived in Indonesia and Singapore. I grew up knowing everything about God, but I didn't know God. 
And so when I went to Russia, I thought, I don't need God. I have my own dreams, my own life, and I will find greatness. But what really is greatness? I asked you already, but I'll say it again. Have you ever wanted to be great? Have you wanted a job promotion? Have you wanted to be the boss? <laughs> Have you thought about greatness in the sense of having the front row seats at concerts or flying first class? Have you wanted to have power, money, authority, fame. These are all the ways that the earth measures greatness. But the story that we are going to read today again in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, offers a different definition of greatness. This conversation between Jesus and his disciples teaches us that true greatness is found in smallness the smallness of a child. Let's take a closer look at this story, starting in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This story that we're reading right now is found in all three synoptic gospels. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if we compare these three accounts, we can find some additional details to this story. For example, for example, Mark tells us that this conversation took place in a house in Capernaum by the, on the Sea of Galilee. We don't know whose house it was. It might have been Peter's house because we know that during a previous visit to Capernaum, Jesus stayed at Peter's house. And I think you remember the story. That's, that's when he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And so it's a good, a good chance that whenever Jesus returned to Capernaum, he stayed at Peter's house. But the story doesn't tell us whose house it was. The verse begins with the words, at that time. What time? If you look back to chapter 17, you'll see that this conversation between Jesus and disciples took place on the very same day that Jesus sent Peter out to catch a fish and find a coin in its mouth. This story took place shortly after Jesus and the 12 disciples returned to Capernaum from a high mountain. On this mountain, you'll remember that Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the very top, and they witnessed a conversation with Elijah and Moses and Jesus. And after that Mount of Transfiguration experience, they came down the mountain, and there... Jesus found this man with a son who was demon-possessed. After Jesus cast out the demon, they then traveled to Capernaum. And as they traveled, the disciples had a dispute among themselves. They talked about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They mistakenly thought that Jesus was going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And they each wanted a place of honor and of power in that kingdom. They wanted to be great. Perhaps this talk of greatness was inspired by the fact that Jesus had taken up Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain, leaving the other nine below. And those nine below thought, something's not right. Those three disciples who went up with Jesus are getting some preferential treatment. Maybe they have a place of honor greater than we're going to get in this earthly kingdom. Now, this dispute over who was going to be great in the kingdom was brought before Jesus in this house in Capernaum. And they wanted Jesus to answer who was going to be the greatest. People have always sought after greatness, it seems. Can you think of anyone who's known for being great? Yeah. Who? Well, in worldly greatness, there's just a whole bunch of modern day greatness. Somebody might want to be, uh, have the money of Elon. There you go. Someone wants to have the greatness, the money, the wealth of Elon Musk, and maybe Twitter, too. (laughs) We know some people. I was thinking this week about some people who are known as being great in their names. Alexander the Great, right? He was even called great to his name because he had the Greek empire that ruled all the known world during that time. Another person known for great was in Russia. 
We have Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. There is Genghis Khan, which actually means the Great Khan. Genghis Khan. There was Cyrus the Great, Frederick the Great of Prussia. And even today, we have people who have names associated with greatness. Millions of boxing fans have idolized a man known as the greatest. Who was that? That's right, Muhammad Ali. Another sports star has earned the nickname The Great One. You know who that is? Yeah, Wayne Gretzky, who played hockey. People want to be great. It seems to be in our blood. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to do our best. God gave each of us talents, and he asks us to use those talents, to develop those talents for his glory. But are we using those talents for ourselves or for God? Who's being made great through those talents? And if we answer to this question, we're developing the talents for ourselves, we have to ask then, where does this desire for success, for personal greatness come from? Where does this desire come from? The desire for greatness for oneself can be traced back to heaven. In describing Lucifer's desire for greatness, Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14 says this, But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. The desire for greatness led to Satan's fall from heaven. It led him into sin. I sought greatness as a journalist when I lived in Russia. And I thought the secret was very simple. Hard work. <laughs> My parents always taught me to work hard, so I thought I can do it through hard work. So I arrived in Russia with $700, and I began to think, how can I get a job at that newspaper? How can I become great? I was in Moscow for only a month when I saw an advertisement for this, in this newspaper for the very lowest position possible, working as a copy editor, a proofreader, no Russian required. So I applied for the job and was hired to be a copy editor. I determined to become a successful copy editor and tried to rise through the ranks. So I worked hard. If they asked me to work four hours shift, I worked eight hours. If they asked me to work eight hours shift, I worked 12 hours. And in four years, I managed to climb from being copy editor already to being deputy editor in chief, the number two position of the newspaper. I thought, this is perfect. I am becoming close to greatness. I'm so close to becoming number one. Now, is there anything wrong with working hard? No. Not at all. In fact, I think you remember what Paul says in the New Testament, he who does not work does not eat. <laughs> it's important to work hard. God gave us work to do, to occupy ourselves. But for what reason did God give us work? I was working hard, and I was determined to become great through my hard work. And I was determined to become number one. The disciples also sought to be great. How did Jesus respond to this, to this question that he was asked? Let's look back at our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verse 2. And he called a child to himself and set him before them. Jesus was asked to settle a dispute about who would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he replied by calling a small boy and setting him before the disciples. Who was this boy? Nobody. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have a name in the Bible, does he? He's not even described in the Bible other than the words a small boy. If this was Peter's house, it could be that it was Peter's son. If Jesus was in somebody else's house, it could have been the son of the master of the house. Or the boy could have come into the house just off the street. In those days, the idea of hospitality was quite a bit different than it is today. In those days, you could walk into somebody's house if you wanted to without even knocking on the door and just come in and see what they were doing and join in on the conversation. I think you remember that quite a few times Jesus was at somebody's house enjoying a meal and the Pharisees and scribes popped in and began asking questions. 
And you might have thought to yourself, what were they doing at that feast? They weren't invited. The fact was, in those days, you were welcome to come to anybody's house you wanted to and join in the conversation. And it could be that this little boy lived in Capernaum, and he had heard about Jesus, the miracle worker. And he heard that he was in this house, and he wanted to see for himself who Jesus was. And so he wandered into the house to see the miracle worker with his own eyes. The Bible doesn't tell us who the boy was. All it says was that he was a small child. What a contrast to the question at hand. The disciples wanted to know who would be the biggest, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus responded by pointing to a small child. Matthew, Mark tells us that Jesus actually took the child and took him into his arms as he then spoke about the child. The little boy was Jesus' answer to the question about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But what was Jesus trying to say? Let's look at the next verse in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So before Jesus answers the question, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, he first sets a condition for even entering the kingdom of heaven. He says, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The word converted does not mean what we might think. We often heard the word, he was converted and became a Christian, as in he was walking in sin, and then he decided to accept Jesus and become his follower. But in this case, we're we have Jesus talking to the disciples, they had already accepted Jesus into their lives. They already decided to follow him. So he was not saying to them, you have to be converted in this sense. The word converted in Greek is translated in other versions with the word change or to turn. You have to change and become like children. You have to turn and become like children. The idea here is that the disciples were walking down a path of pride, a path toward personal greatness. And Jesus is saying, you have to turn. You have to turn completely around and go in another direction. You need to follow a path toward becoming like a child. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said, become like a child? It didn't mean that Jesus wanted the disciples to become like children in all things. The Anabaptists, several centuries ago in Germany, read this passage and took it very literally. Members of this offshoot sought to become like children by dressing in swaddling clothes, babbling like babies, and running around the streets carrying rattles. That's not what Jesus meant when he talked about becoming like a child. As I sought personal greatness at this newspaper in Russia, I didn't once think about being like a child. I wanted to be a great adult. I wanted to make big money, and I wanted to become famous. And most of all, I wanted to become number one, editor-in-chief. And so I continued to work really, really hard. And one year passed, and two years passed, and three years passed, and four years passed, and five years passed, and I thought, what is going on? It took me only four years to become the number two editor-in-chief, but now that top job seems just to be so elusive. The current editor-in-chief wasn't moving. She stayed on and on and on. And I was getting a little frustrated and a little discouraged. True greatness seemed to be eluding me. But you know, my friends, when you're seeking personal greatness on your own without God, things can change in your own life too. I was raised in an Adventist home. I was raised with certain standards. And as I sought my own way, on my own terms, I slowly left those standards I've been raised with. One of the things I was doing is I was, I was smoking, and I was smoking a lot, two packs a day. And a day came when I began to experience some pains in my chest, and I thought, what is going on? I was a bit worried, but I thought, this will pass. But the pains increased and I began to feel my chest, and I thought I noticed perhaps a small lump there. So I went to the doctor in Moscow, and I asked what was going on, and the doctor did some scans, some x-rays, and she said to me, 
we notice a lump there. Most likely, you have cancer. This was not my plans of becoming great. <laughs> I did not plan to have cancer before becoming a great journalist. I did not plan to die before becoming a great journalist. I was really scared. And for the first time in nine years, I thought about God. And I said, God, I haven't talked to you in a long time, but I don't want to die. So if you will take this cancer away, I promise you I will go to church on Sabbath. <laughs> a week later, I went back to the hospital for some more checkups, and the doctor said to me, I made a mistake. There's no lump there. You don't have cancer. I did not go to church the next Sabbath. I was not worried anymore about dying. I was back to pursuing my dreams of greatness. A few more months passed, and I began to experience some more health issues of a completely different nature. Again, I was very scared. Again, I thought I was going to die. Again, I thought about God. But this time, I could not pray to God. This time, I could not say to God, I will do this if you do this for me, because I knew that my word was worthless. I'd already promised God something, and I had not made good on that very small promise of going to church on Sabbath. So now I knew that I couldn't promise anything more because my word was, was, my word was, was worthless. So I said to God, God, I am nobody. I can't even make a promise to you to go to church on Sabbath because I don't even know if I can keep it. All I know is that I've been following a path that could end very quickly. I could die within a few weeks, a few months even. I have nothing to offer you. I've only worked for myself for nine years, but I'm going to follow you now no matter what happens next. If you have a plan for me, please fulfill it in my life. And if you don't have a plan for me, I will still seek you because my path has just led toward death. I called my dad and my mom and I told them that I wanted to quit my job and become a pastor. I thought the only thing I could do after spending nine years living with myself would be to preach God's word. My mom and my dad were very happy to hear this. But they said, you know, it's November. It's kind of hard to enter the seminary in November. We suggest that you pray a little bit more and see if God has another plan for you. I didn't like that idea at all. But I saw the wisdom, so I continued to pray. And very reluctantly realized I should stay at my job at the newspaper and wait for God to reveal his plan for me. Two months passed. And during those two months, God made some big changes in my life already. I stopped smoking. By his grace, he helped me do that. I started going to church every Sabbath. And I went to church with the plan to seek God. Amen. I promised myself I would not go to church to look at other people, but to look at Jesus. So those two months passed, and then the publisher of the newspaper called me into her office, and she said, Andy... I have some news for you. The editor-in-chief is leaving. You will be the next editor-in-chief. I couldn't believe it. I had tried for five and a half years to get that job, and I'd never been able to get it. But just two months after I gave my heart to Jesus, I got the job of my dreams. I got the job that I thought was true greatness. And you know something? I already didn't even want it. <laughs> I had other ideas of what I wanted. God is so good. Amen. He gives you more than you could ever ask or think. But he gave me that job only after I humbled myself, after I stopped seeking greatness, and you could say after I became like a child. I no longer sought my own course, but I said to Jesus, Jesus, lead me. This was childlike humility. It didn't come 
from within myself. It came by God's grace. I stopped trying to pursue my own path of greatness and surrendered everything to God. Only then could he intervene and guide me down his path. And my friends, I've seen this scenario repeated again and again in my life. Every time I've stopped seeking my own greatness and placed myself in God's hand, he's been able to, to actually guide me into great things. That's actually how I finally ended up leaving Russia after 17 years there. By surrender, childlike surrender, God led me out of Russia to another place to work at the General Conference. It was actually also how I met my wife three years ago. I married her just because I sought God's leading. Amen. Let's read on what Jesus said next to the disciples. That was the first step, to become like a child. What did Jesus say next? Let's look at verse 4. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to humble oneself like a child? What does it mean to be humble? Jesus was holding the small child in his arms when he said these words. And I can imagine the small boy looking very shyly down at the ground as Jesus speaks. He may not even understand what Jesus is saying about humility. All he knows is that these big adult men are looking at him with curiosity as he is the center of attention in a very important conversation. How are little children humble? Of course, there's always ex ex exceptions. But generally, little children do not follow a path of their own creating. They go in the direction they are guided. I am still learning by the grace of God to follow his path with humility. After I became editor-in-chief, I said to you, my desire was to move on, but how? I thought, how can I move on? How can I work more for God and not just on the weekends, as it seemed to me? And so I thought, as a journalist, there's one way to do it. It's who you know. I need connections. And so I wrote some articles I thought the Adventist Church might like, and I sent them to Adventist Review. No response. I wrote another article, sent to Adventist Review. No response. I wrote a third article. No response. And I thought to myself, I don't know anybody there. That's why they're not responding. I need to find someone and let them know that I'm here with training as a journalist and ready to write for the Adventist Church. I went to the Moscow International Church, and there, because they spoke only English, we had a, a flood of guests from the GC visiting every once in a while. I saw the, one of the first people I saw as I thought about who to connect with was the president of ADRA. I thought, ADRA, that'd be great to work there. So I gave him a business card as editor-in-chief of the newspaper, and I said to him, if you have any need for a good writer, I'm here. He was very kind to me, took the card, but no job offers. Mm -hmm. Then I saw the director of the publishing ministry at the General Conference coming through town. I gave him my business card, and I said, if you ever have any openings, I'm happy to help out in any way. He was very kind to me, but no job offers came my way. And I thought to myself, what is wrong with these Avenists? Don't they know that if you give connections, give business cards, you have experience, that they'll hire you? Did you hire them? Nothing happened. I grew more and more discouraged, and I thought, what am I doing here now in Russia? Yes, I had, a, I had my dream job, but I wanted to do more for God. What could I do next? I'll never forget this. One day, I was sitting in my kitchen in my apartment in Moscow. I was reading the Sabbath school lesson, and as I read, I saw these words. I saw the words Jesus speaking to his disciples. He was speaking in John chapter 15, verse 16, and Jesus said these words, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. I thought to myself, Jesus appoints me. I don't appoint myself. This is a new idea. 
I would spend his whole time trying to appoint myself to a job. Here it says Jesus has to choose me. But how? It doesn't make any sense at all. How is he going to choose me? How is he going to call me to write for him somewhere else? How is he going to call me to do something else? I had no idea. And, but I saw that what I've been trying to do already now for months wasn't working. So I said, God, I get it. I can't do it. It says here, you choose me. If you want me to work for you, call me somehow. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'll just wait because I don't know what else to do. It was the most difficult decision I made my whole life, to be honest with you. It was hard giving my heart to God the first time, but surrendering my desire to see greatness by going out there and networking like I had been taught to do as a journalist was even harder. But I prayed the prayer, and I gave it up. A few minutes later, I checked my email for the first time that day. I waited to do that after my worship, and I saw there was an email there from Adventist Review. I was surprised. I'd contacted them last, like maybe a year and a half earlier with an article. I opened it up, and they wrote, we saw one of the articles you sent to us. We like it. We're going to publish it. Please send us information about who you are so we can publish the article. I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. God had answered my question to write a story for the church the very same morning that I had surrendered to him and waited for him to call me. It was, it was all I could do not to write back and say, thank you so much, and I have 500 more stories I can write for you right now, too. <laughs> I just wrote back and said, Thank you so much. Here's the information you sought. And that was it. I thought, if God wants me to write a second article, he'll have to call me. Well, guess what, my friends? A month later, they wrote back to me again and said, thank you for the article. Would you be kind enough to write to us another article, a cover story for Adventist World? So I did. At the end of that year, they wrote, at the end of that year, they wrote to me again and said, now could you please write, we'd like, we'd like for you to become a columnist for the Adventist Review and write for us a monthly column. So I did that for the next five years. And then it led to God opening more doors and having me invited over there to work at the Adventist Review. And now I work for Adventist Mission, writing mission stories. But each of those steps came only as I surrendered to God, only as I said, I am not calling myself. I'm waiting for you to call me. And this, my friends, is the spirit of a child. A child does not usually call himself. A child is called and led. And this is exactly what Jesus was talking about, about being converted, turning around in the path toward greatness and being led by God, by the hand, like a child, right to him, to his way. This spirit of rivalry that was cherished by the disciples made them childish, but Jesus was calling them to become childlike. The, desires had, the disciples had a desire to be first, but they forgot that true greatness involves the renunciation of greatness as a goal in life. The moment a person sets out to be great, he or she gives evidence of their littleness, of the littleness of their soul. So we've seen that Jesus' answer to the question of who will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven has two steps. The first step is to turn from the path of following personal greatness and going in the opposite direction in total childlike dependence on God. The second step is to be humble like a little child and obediently stay in that path of total dependence on God. Have you ever met someone like that? Marsha mentioned that last month I was in Africa. And in Africa, I met a little girl just like that. I was in Accra, the capital of Ghana. And on the very same day I was going to leave to fly back to Texas, they took me to a public school I met a little 13-year-old girl whose name is Ellen N.T. White. Her father had a favorite author, you can probably guess, and he named his daughter after his favorite author. The family name was N.T., and so her name ended up being Ellen N.T. White. And she told me this story. She said that just six months earlier, she had noticed in her neighborhood a little girl whose name was Ajara. Ajara was only nine years old, so there was quite a big age difference between the two. But, in, but Ellen noticed that Ajara did not go to church on Sabbath. And she saw that Ajara was just staying at home. And so she said to Ajara, why don't you come with me to church on Sabbath? Ajara agreed. And so they walked together two miles to the Adventist church to worship together. Ajara loved the church. She loved the singing. She loved the Bible stories. 
And in fact, I met Ajara as well, and she very happily told me several stories from the Bible from memory about Joseph, about Jesus. She loves Jesus. And so she went to, to the Adventist church with her friend Ellen for two Sabbaths in a row. But then Ajara's parents noticed that she was going to the Adventist church, and they were furious. They belonged to another world religion, and they did not want their daughter going to the Adventist church. And the mother said, Ajara, you may not go to that church anymore. And she kept her home the next Sabbath. And Ajara cried the whole day. And so the mother allowed her to go back to church the next Sabbath. But she still didn't like the idea, and her father didn't like the idea either. And so when the mother and father saw that Ajara was going to church every Sabbath still, they decided to move from that town back to their hometown, quite some distance away, near the, near the border with Ivory Coast, and to place the girl with her grandmother. When Ajira learned that she was going to live now with her grandmother and no longer be able to go to the Adventist church with Ellen, she began to cry. And she cried and she cried. She said, I want to go to church on Sabbath with Ellen. I want to learn about Jesus. She told her mother, if you're going to keep me here, I will walk back so I can go to church. Finally, the parents relented and decided to take their daughter back to the other town, back to the neighborhood where Ellen lived. Ellen had no idea why Ajara had disappeared for two weeks, but she was happy to see Ajara return on a Friday and said, tomorrow, let's go to church together. And they did. They've gone to church together every Sabbath since then. And today, Ajara is eagerly learning the Bible and memorizing Bible verses. Six months ago, she had never heard about Jesus. Today, she loves Jesus with all her heart. The kingdom of heaven belongs to children like Ellen and T. White. She was 13, and Ajara was only nine, but she played no difference. She paid no attention to the difference in their ages. She just saw a girl who didn't know Jesus. Ellen belonged to the Adventist church, and Ajara belonged to another world religion. But Ellen paid no attention to the difference in the religions. She just saw a little girl who didn't know Jesus. For Ellen, there was no desire for personal greatness. All she wanted was to introduce Ajara to Jesus. And she did. To such belong the kingdom of heaven. We read today the memory, the, the scripture reading was this very words. Jesus talking to disciples. Another instance, just a short time after this story took place, when the mothers brought their children to Jesus, the disciples said, go away. Jesus said, let the children alone. Do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus spoke many times, at least six times in the three Gospels we just mentioned, about the importance of children, the importance of being childlike, the importance of children entering, being like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? Amen. Jesus says very forcibly in the verse that we read today, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. These words here, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven, is not quite as forcible as it sounds in Greek. In Greek, it actually says, truly I say to you, unless you're converted and become like children, you will never, ever, ever enter the kingdom of heaven. The words here in Greek are very forceful. There's a double negative there. The words are ou me. It means never, ever, ever. So for example, when Peter recalled the thought of, washing Jesus, of Jesus washing his feet, he said to Jesus, never, ever, ever shall you wash my feet. When Peter insisted that he would never deny Christ, he said, even if I have to die with you, I will never, ever, ever deny you. And Jesus also used these words to emphasize his own statements. At the Last Supper, Jesus declared, but I say to you, I will never, ever, ever drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And in our story today, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never, ever, ever enter the kingdom of heaven. The question before us today is, do you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? Are you willing 
to turn around on that path of seeking personal greatness and do a complete reversal, whether it be moving away from a desire for wealth, fame, position, or power, and instead go in the opposite direction and follow Christ with the self-dependence of a little child? Are you willing to have the humility of a child and stay on that path of full surrender to God? One day soon, a small cloud will appear in the eastern sky, and it will grow brighter and brighter and whiter and whiter. And above the cloud, there will be a brilliant rainbow, and underneath there will be a flash of lightning. And in the very center of that cloud, we will see our King Jesus, Amen. our great Lord and our great Savior. Amen. And he will look down, and he will say to you, my child, my beloved, enter into the kingdom that I have prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come, come to me. And if you have the obedience, the dependence of a child, you will obey that command and follow that path up to him in the clouds. And we'll rise up to him and meet him. Is this your desire? Yes. Amen. Will you join me today in saying, Jesus, I want to, dis- to forsake my desire for the greatness of this world, and instead I want to be your child today and every day, humbly seeking you, listening to your voice, and following your leading in full surrender. Amen. If this is your desire, would you raise your hand with me? Yes. Praise God. Let's pray, shall we?